several things I wanted to just kind of scroll through. Um, why at least reason I put it up on the uh, the, uh, the board for us tonight. First thing is the DDA tree slash sign proposal. Um, we have some members of the DDA here this evening. Um, it is um, several weeks ago. There was an article in the newspaper that indicated that the city of Manistee had received two thousand dollars for a grant from the Northwest Michigan Council of Governments for to put trees in the downtown. But I'm reading this on a Saturday morning thinking, well, I don't think you can put trees in the town. It's not hard. So I started chatting with Travis and doing some more research. And um, this is all included in your packet for you. Um, but what I wanted to get to here was, uh, quickly, that is a grant that was submitted by um, the DEA for the trees. The concept is to put the trees in large planters. Um, uh, one of the things that Travis talked to me about was that he had been having conversations with the previous UPW director, uh, Jeff, in regards to this almost being an incubator concept also for the city of Manistee tree program. So these trees, once they got too mature to be in the planters, could have been possibly be located into uh, my front yard, or nurse front yard, or one of our parts. Uh, in the right away, we talked about the right away. Uh, but our tree replacement program is what I'm referring to. Um, interestingly, and when we did our streetscape in the early 1990s, late 1990s, excuse me, um, there was a referendum vote. Um, and this is actually the ballot of that referendum vote. Um, and number three, there shall be no trees in the sidewalk portion of the street between the Division Street, Pine Street, except in the present Marina Park. And the existing trees shall remain, but when they are removed because of the deterioration, they shall not be replaced in this area. And that was approved. Right. Uh, that referendum, which led to this particular ordinance, which had similar language, almost obviously identical language, Again, C, 1028.01C, there shall be no trees in the sidewalk portion of the street between the Vision Street and the Pine Street, you see the Marina Park, Park area. Uh, the existing trees can stay until they're deteriorated and they could not be placed back in. <coughs> City Attorney George Saylor said that this language, which was part of the, the ballot proposal, could not be changed in the city ordinance for a period of two years. And we think this was done in the late 1990s, so we're well beyond the two-year period of time in which um, we could amend the ordinance to allow trees in downtown, uh, and which is the reason that we're here this evening uh, in front of city council. In order to put the trees in downtown, whether we put them in the sidewalk, actually remove sidewalk squares, like we've seen in Boyd City and in uh, Big Rapids and other locations, or we keep them in the planters. We believe, both myself and City Attorney George Saylor believes, that that language needs to be amended in order for that to occur. Um, and again, whether they're in the planters or they're in the sidewalk, or they're actually in the ground, we believe this language prohibits that from occurring. So if council is interested in the concept, um, as the DDA is, and may be helpful to hear from Travis and Jackson and other here tonight, um, we would have to amend that ordinance. Again, it's an ordinance. The process is Council Ordinance Committee, staff drafts the ordinance, Council Ordinance Committee, two readings, and you can change that. Um, I just had one question. On C, it says, uh, except in the present Marina Park, any existing tree shall remain, but when they are removed because of deterioration, they shall not be replaced. So, that means in the marina park, if the tree dies, that we can't? No, we both read that as that was the exception. To the entire rule. To the entire rule. Okay. Um, in the existing trees, so, so at some point in time, you must have trees in downtown. Is that accurate? I don't <coughs> ever remember seeing them. I've, see, I've seen them. I've Not seen old photos. I mean old photos <laughs> where there were trees downtown, but I mean they were old. Like pre nineteen thirty. We have we have reviewed this as a <coughs> trees could be replaced within the marina, the grass area where the where the uh, swings are at mm -hmm. in those locations down there. 
um, but not within the sidewalk. No, we did the mayor's exchange down in Big Rapids, I think. I don't know if Councilman Ricardo was not there, but we saw what trees can do for downtown and how nice it looked. And I believe at the time, all council was really impressed. Mm -hmm. they excited about doing something like that somewhere in town in the NSD. I would say almost all of the mayor's exchanges that we've done recently in the downtown, the downtown to the trees. Now, do, we, do we know whether um, the distance between the buildings and the street, the width of the sidewalks, is nearer than these? Like Big Rapids and these other places that may cause. I mean, I'm still in favor of doing something, but just trying to look at all the potential. That's a really good question. I don't know the answers as to the width of our sidewalks <coughs> compared to the other communities. I don't know. I don't know if Travis knows that answer. I don't know. Speak from back there. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that, please. Um, in terms of um, distances and placement of sidewalks, mm -hmm. I don't know the exact, but it's it's comparable. I think the other thing that we need to talk about tonight is even if we are interested in that, are they in the planters? Um, and if they are, I think that we also need to have a conversation with our Department of Public Works Director, Jeff McCullough, as to what are some of the impacts associated with um, well, that's, that's uh, I would say storming was probably not an issue because no. if we're in a current planner, we can probably remove them. But that was in storage, your own care. What, you know, what happens with those planners? I mean, these stuff like this are picking up a you know. I think we can change the language, you know, and whether it's a doable project or not, that, I think that's a different issue. Different issue. But if it's something that we like. The concept. The concept and changing our ordinance for something that we can work towards that. <coughs> you know, who's responsible for the maintenance, how it would be taken care of. You know, I think those are all really important issues that we would have to be resolved before we have actually put the trees in there. I don't think that's part of whether we want to change the ordinance or not. If we think that's a good. <clears throat> but I think we, there's, there's probably consensus that you know having green space in our downtown and, and pushing towards that from our strategic plan and things of that nature are, are definitely in the scope of what we've been trying to accomplish. And, and our downtown does doesn't have a lot of green space and, and, and foliage down there. So um, with the planter boxes that we have down there, I would love to see some additional, you know, green space activity. But I think we have to be considered uh, conscious of the things we just talked about with BDA or BDA director uh, Jeff and, and, and what we're going to do with that. And also we have to be conscious of uh, our our businesses down there. You know, where are they? You know, we want to block the storefront and we want to block signs. We want to make sure that they're in a, you know spots where. Um, they make the most sense without uh, um, too much. Okay, so they're usually like, almost completely adjacent to the curb. Because um, if you go in any further, then you are beginning to <coughs> entrance to buildings, pedestrian traffic is disrupted. And if we change the ordinance to allow trees in the downtown, um, what's the next step? Well, council then, so that's the first step in moving towards that. And then the discussions of how would it look, who's responsible for the maintenance. Now, what, if we approve that, does that just give the DBA the complete authority just to go ahead and do what, or would it be brought back to council for review and discussion? I think we'd set the parameters, but they would have kind of within the next uh, looking for, but just so. Kind of like the DBA and the R3 Commission working together possibly. There are so many different ways we could take it. Yeah, I would think that we would definitely, I, I would look at it, Mayor and Council, and I said, um, we definitely need to bring Jeff on this, I think, would be a key. And um, bringing in his input as to how do we minimize the maintenance of this, if we choose to go down this road. Um, I too think, coming from Grand Gable, where we got trees all over our downtown, I think they add a lot of, I think they break up the downtown, and we give it some. Some uh, they, give it a, they just break it out from the concrete and the, and the brick. Yeah. Um, I think we have to look at the type of tree too. Kind of like I think you know, all those things. I, I guess my, my thought, Mary, is that we probably want to bring back a proposal as to how you would, how this would be implemented if we chose to do so. If we did this ordinance thing, then the city staff would work cooperatively with the DDA staff mm -hmm. to present a ordinance. I don't think it would be in the I don't believe it would be in the partial unification because it's not in part. Um, tree commission. Tree commission could be involved. 
if we're going to be bringing people off of US 31, um, how do we allow them to circulate better in the downtown? We kind of got as far as we were going to get with that before focusing back on, on the US 31 traffic capture. And what was identified pretty uh, fundamentally is that the sign that's currently there, uh, where, where Mitch talked about, it's a pretty sign, but it's, it's not a functional sign in the way that we want this project to be functional in terms of identifying, okay, now you have entered downtown Manistee, and here's where you turn to get to the commercial district. So going through a redesign of what signage could look like specifically in that location, um, this is what it is in front of you. Unfortunately, the colors aren't really well depicted <coughs> in this. I think it's because it's a it's a copy. Um, but the way that this was designed is to be um, fairly substantial in size, very readable, um, obviously updated um, aesthetically. Um, using a term using the term historic downtown versus Victorian. Um, but also, if you look at the, at the logo, the downtown Manistee, Michigan there, that's intentionally um, intended to be kind of in the same family tree as the um, Manistee County logo and branding that the Convention and Visitors Bureau is using in association with Pure Michigan. Um, it's not using the exact same fonts or anything like that, but it's intended to look like it you know, came from the same family. Specifically about this, what this sign would also allow as it's spec'd out, um, and it has been approved by the, the Main Street EDA board, is that section there where it says historic downtown, just so you have a scale, that's a three by 12 section, three foot by <coughs> 12 feet wide. The way that this is spec'd out is there would be um, metal tracks on the top and bottom of that section where we would be able to slide in three by 12 basically panels um, for specific messaging that we wanted to do, whether it's Slay Bell Weekend, um, December 5th through 8th, um, Paint the Town Pink um, this coming week, those sorts of things that right now is, is kind of done via the, the banners up on the River Street Arch. Um, the banners on, on the River Street Arch um, are parallel to US 31, so you can't really see them as you're driving by. Um, this is a situation where we'd be able to directly message to all, you know, 20,000 cars, however many days a day, that goes by that location. But this would only affect northbound traffic, right? No, this would be this would be northbound side, north and south. Yeah. Obviously, with it being located south of River Street, mm -hmm. we would still be able to push <laughs> northbound because you can get there from Filer, you can get there from First Street. Obviously, that's where then the circulation plays a part. But this is kind of the, the first piece of it. So it would, it would be on a 90 degree angle, so it would be. Just like it is now perpendicular to US 31. How big is the whole sign? Excuse me? How big is the whole sign? Um, 12 feet wide, it, it says in, in the, the spec sheet. Okay. Okay. So yeah. 9 feet 8 inches high, 12 feet eight. wide by 12 inches deep. Right. right. So okay. 9 by 8 times 12 by. And you're saying the sliders are going to be on top? Bottom or within that just space. just the, the section that says historic downtown the three by twelve. Well, so you can take a three by twelve section of dive bond panel that'll have be digitally printed with whatever messaging you want to have on there, and we can slide that in there. And so okay. then when slave levels over, we can slide it back out and it'll default back to historic downtown. What type of material is this going to be? Um, it's steel, metal. I mean, it's all. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's not all that. It's not illuminated. It's, it's, it would be illuminated with the existing exterior illumination that's there currently. Okay. <coughs> it, not, not interior illuminated. No, no I understand that great the sign, you know, updating that. My concern is using the, man, the pure Michigan, that's going to be as relevant as the Michigan, pure Michigan campaign is. I mean, they do change that out. This. I like the sign overall, but it doesn't really differentiate us from any other Michigan community. Perhaps maybe instead of Manistee Pure Michigan, a silhouette of a Victorian or like the downtown, just to set us 
you know, something to, make, to set it apart, make it more interesting to bring people downtown would be my suggestion. And saying historic downtown, that means not that. It well, probably doesn't. Some people does, some people probably doesn't. Um, but it doesn't to be really set what's unique about the community. Yeah. It doesn't capture that. And possibly maybe not there. Mm -hmm. So the Pier of Michigan, again, I'm a little bit concerned about how relevant that will be once if Michigan turns into a different tourist type slogan. <clears throat> So how hard would it be? How hard? Let me, let me answer. I guess kind of address two of those things. The Manistee Pier, Michigan, there on the bottom. That's that is a that is a, a, a vinyl application on on the metal there. If after three years or however long, if the county no longer participates in Pier, Michigan, you can easily remove that. Mm -hmm. It will just be a, a black band there. The second thing regarding um, making something more unique or more. Um, I guess engaging. Um, the, the 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 goal of, of this signage is not to um, wow someone and convey the message of what downtown Manistee is. It's it's intended to be directional. If you look at um, just standard DOT signage, mm -hmm. okay, just the green with the arrows, it's extremely functional. And when we're trying to direct people who are passing through where downtown Manistee is. That's that's the primary function of, of, of this project. And you can look at the sign that's there now, and yes, it's very, very visual, visually appealing. It's very nice, it's very ornate, it's Victorian. It, it harkens to you know what the identity of downtown Manistee has been for a long time. But does it function as a sign to get people to go down River Street? I don't, Our argument is I don't think I don't think you're I don't think you're understanding I mean, I don't, personally, I don't want Victorian fruit, fruit but this does absolutely <coughs> nothing for me at all. As, and if I were going somewhere and <coughs> I would have no desire to turn in the direction they told me to take the It needs, it's too much words. It's, it, there's too much type. There's no other visual. And you need some kind of visual. The sketch artist, um, the sketch artist, as you guys did, the buildings, the way he would draw them all, that would be perfect to have that layered underneath the downtown Manistee. But you need something more other than a bunch of verbiage, one after another, different pipelines. That's just how I look at it from a I guess I guess I differ a little bit. Uh, you put too much on the sign and the people can't can't grasp it right away. I think this at least they, they can see downtown Manistee shop at Diamond Riverfront. And they can, when they first see the sign, they know it's <coughs> too much on there. People aren't going to uh, look at it that much. You know, they're going to say, well, I'm going to get rid of the white spaces there because that's very important. Well, I don't no, know. What, I, what I'm saying is that there's so much with other communities trying to grab the, the tourism. And when a sign that's so much like all the other signage you see, going along, going up north, going downstate, what's going to draw people to to see look at that sign other than downtown? I mean, sometimes a visual picture will draw you to look at the sign, and then you see the shop and guiding the riverfront to draw, and then the direction will take you downtown. That's all I'm suggesting, is that there's, I think it needs just a little bit something more to capture a person's eye their attention, because you have just that little bit of time to grab that, their attention. And, 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 and believe me, all of, I apologize for my sound, all of this has been discussed at length. And what, what, what you're looking in front of you is the result of, and I'm not exaggerating, hours of discussion about this, not just with members of our volunteer committee, but professionals in design and graphic design and branding business. And so I totally understand that when, when it comes down to anything, signage, branding, logos, that sort of thing, it's an extremely subject, subjective topic. People like it, people don't, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Where we run into the issue is design by committee, where it's like, we like this little piece, or we like this, we want it, and then it, it doesn't necessarily function the way we want it to. I mean, obviously, 
we want the blessing of city council to move forward with this. So if there are fundamental things that council would like to see changed with this, if that's going to mean us being able to move forward, then by all means, we'll, we'll do that. Um, I'm just trying to articulate how we've got to this point, I guess. Well, and I, I have a different opinion than, than the mayor as well. I like it that it's tied to some of the other branding. Because people are going to start recognizing those from the internet, from Facebook, from uh, the Pure Michigan ads. When you start recognizing font and, and, and familiar tones and, and, and looks, you start thinking, oh, that's, that's what I saw on, on the internet. Oh, that's what I saw on the Pure Michigan ad. And they start connecting that with, oh, downtown must be connected to some of those things. For me, that's what it does. It captures those connections. It's not except in the exact same font, but it's in the same family. I can, can make the connections to the Pure Michigan ads. That's why right now, from what I've seen, Pure Michigan ads have made Michigan quite a destination uh, from the last five years. Uh, so I, I like those connections personally. <clears throat> and I think we do, we do need to increase our foot traffic down, downtown. And to be honest with you, the old side, I don't even remember where it is anymore. I don't even remember what you're talking about it. I drive that drive every day and I can't speak any. I can't today. Literally, I can't remember where it is yeah. and what it says. So they know. I can't, yeah. I can't, I don't, I don't, it doesn't even register my head. I just so say, well, I just well, 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 even, even a different side than what's there is going to draw to attention because people like me are so routine that they, they, they lost the, 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 lost the, the visual aspect of it. So. Again, I, I like the idea that it's utilitarian, but it connects to the, the marketing ploy, or the marketing scheme that is out there for Pure Michigan and downtown Manistee. But again, that's just my opinion, I just differ a little bit than, than, than what I see there. You know, you can have 50 people on every, all yep. 50 people are going to have different opinions. I, I you know. Uh, you can talk about it because you not have, um, occasionally have sliders in here, which and more of the graphics and things of that nature that 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 we are going to be the intent is for mm -hmm. is more visually and, and graphic. So specifically talk about it. Mean, but if you want it directional, then everything that you're advertising you have to have that directional arrow. But what I like about that is that, again, it changes the sign once in a while, which catches my attention. I mean, once in a while, there's something new in there, and then I'm thinking, oh, that's how it's going to be. Oh, that's how. As opposed to the one that's right now buried in the hill that I can't even remember what it looks like. Right? And then what it looks like. Well, and part of the nice thing, too, about that, having being able to slide the, that messaging in there, is it would allow us to specifically advertise not just um, downtown events, but also specific retail sorts of things, sidewalk sales. Um, we would be able to, we've talked about um, oh, I love that. having, well, ha having the ability to um, work with individual businesses. I mean, Snyder's Shoe Summer Sale. I mean, those are things that draw lots and lots of people downtown, and the more we can just kind of work together on that. that that's the idea. Yeah, it's key. It's picture for the summer. Right. Right. No, and that's a great aspect, and I like the idea that you'll be able to change that Pure Michigan when and if they decide to change their slogan. With Brent Sports Manager. So, so, and then this is part of the same project, which um, the idea is to place these um, a couple blocks south of that intersection and a couple blocks north of that intersection. Because as we know, there's no turn lane. If you're in the wrong lane of traffic, it's difficult to get, especially left if you're heading, uh, heading north. So to give people just a little bit more advance notice that downtown is coming up. And these we did specifically try to mirror um, MDOT um, design aesthetics. Where it's, again, very utilitarian downtown Manistee. So these, would be, um, these are in addition to what you just showed? That's that's what's being proposed. So this would be at the like the West Hill. Um, this this would side. be on the north side. They'd be at around. Uh, we've talked about the Harrison Street intersection. Okay. Um, and then as you're coming from the <coughs> south, um, you know the second or first street area. You need to pick up with the Harrison Street because that was the street that was widened to. That was the if you're followed not too long ago. MDOT, the the changes they made that to across the bridge was to direct traffic down Harrison Street, not Lincoln. Well that's if you're going that's if you're going northbound. Correct. This this would be facing south. So this would be a simply a south. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, kind of again that that advance right. And then we did um, integrate the Manistee Pure Michigan. We really feel that attaching the Pure Michigan branding to this, for lack of a better term, legitimizes what we're selling to to a certain degree. Um, and again, that's that's the that's the brand that we're using for advertising far and wide for the community. <coughs> and we've talked a lot at the Main Street DDA board level about, you know, do we try to differentiate downtown Manistee as a brand, or do we try to kind of piggyback to a certain extent without being a clone? Um, so we're all kind of beating the drum together. Because that's really what we feel like we're trying to do, is it's not just downtown trying to wave the flag and say, hey, here we are. It's the entire Manistee County. So this is this again is, is part of that proposed concept. When we were at um, several of us attended the conference in um, Detroit not too long ago, and um, one of the sessions Bob Ed and I were taking a walk uh, along the riverfront of Detroit, and I thought Ed made a really really astute comment that um, in regards to the state of Michigan. Um, you know, we're also into placemaking. And from the MML's perspective, they want everyone to look alike. Everyone everyone to do something very, very similar. We all want to have a third place and this kind of coffee shop here and we need this over here and we need great space. But it's almost like turning our communities into replicas of themselves from that perspective. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's what you were referring to, Mayor Kenny, is that we really need to still embrace the third place concepts and and the placemaking concepts and all of those things, but how do we embrace them by still being Giddy, Manistee, not Potassi? How do we embrace them by being Manistee, not Lovington? And I think that's really the challenge that I hear at the Sands tonight is that we understand we need to change, but um, we want still some uniqueness and then tying into Council of the Residents production that. Hey, the Pure Man Ski is a really popular campaign right now, and it's moving forward, um, going forward. So I don't know if that helps you at all. I know you've already thought about it. That signage isn't what makes a community unique. Oh, completely agree. The place of downtown Man is what's right. unique. We're right. just trying to get people to know that it's there. And the accidental tourist, which there are a lot of them. It's, it's amazing how many people stumble onto Man Ski who are up here for sleeping bear. Mm -hmm. As an example. Yeah. I, talked to, I talked to people at Glen Harbor the other day, and they were going south, uh, 31, and they asked me where I was from, and they said, Man, it's state. And I said, Oh, yeah, we uh, went through your downtown area. It's very nice. And they, they didn't say whether they saw the sign or not, but they did uh, go through, uh, you know, the sun. I think something like this would uh, even be better to draw, uh, you know, the tourists or people passing through to uh, at least to go through. Uh, uh, I would also like it if the signs that say beach area could direct people down River Street instead mm -hmm. of First Street. That would be awesome. Too. But <laughs> you want all of those boats going down this. Well, yeah, and tonight what I was really hoping to accomplish, and I was trying to find a photograph of that sign for Councilmember Gustav, so you know what it is. Um, and I'm unable, I, I thought I had it someplace on the website, but I can find it if I can. Yeah, I think a lot of Time that's put into these um, but the intent for tonight was to just simply give council a little bit of forewarning and, and some other ideas to what we're talking about. We talked about bringing some of these more important items to work sessions first, or they just appear in front of you. So that was my goal for this evening was to present this to you so you would have a good understanding about the direction that the design committee was working on. Um, if, for example, if the design committee continues to work on two way traffic, I would see this as a same venue of coming to council in the work session. We may have had one at point in time more, have a more directed conversation. Can you bring the tables up here? 
Thank you very much. Would you come in? Yeah, let's just do it this one. What is your timeline? What is your timeline for getting these? Uh, you remember that? Uh, we wanted to have this in place for Slave Bell Weekend to be able to put have Slave Bell Weekend be the first uh, message on there. But until we but until we had the blessing of council, um, we didn't want to get too much further if it was going to be a non-starter. The, the, the concern was. It's, a, it's, it's definitely a departure aesthetically from the big Okay, that's what I know we will say. I hope I know it. Yeah. Do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that's why oh. I decided that it doesn't ever change, loses its appeal, loses its, yeah. its, its utility value. Because well, so to watch the tourists, that, yeah, the tourists coming yeah, through, right. they don't see it every day. Yeah, nobody else has a nice sign. Say that again? And to us driving in all the time, yeah, we're the name of it, but I mean, some of the old companies are that stands out. Well, I think that's a good point because how many times do you see someone standing and taking a picture of a sign? They won't take pictures of these signs, they took a picture of that sign and posted it online. So, I mean, it's a, but is that what it's intended to be for? It's not intended to be scenery, it's intended to be functional to help people get to where they're trying to get. Okay, at the same point, it caught somebody's eye. That's what you. That's what I think. Colin just, said. Just, you know, just, that, you just put those party what you got there. You know. Yeah. yeah. Just, 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 just the street. Not some block. So some dancing LED lights around it and stuff. Hey, no, 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 flashing arrow. It to me. What you're looking for is directional. Just use that. Don't even go to the expense of the other one. True. Just use this one. No, you want to. I think I think tell people what's honestly, I think we did that. I think just we just did this would look more like a state sign rather than a destination sign. This looks more like I think you're entering the um what are those things called? Not business district. This is more oh, actually even though it says it's correct downtown. Yeah. Might be more of a like you said, it's it, there can there can be it can be interpreted in many different ways. Yeah. But again, tonight was just to Present that information to you tonight and ask for <coughs> your answer. Some questions. I don't think we're going to add it. But what's going to happen now? Officially. Are you going back to redesign this? Or well, I don't think this really, this really isn't what they've come. This really isn't a health decision. This is much more of a refugee for international This is a new thing. Finally. I like Travis. He's doing a good job. So. Great, thank you very much. It's not even worth For your for we have, thank you very much for 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 coming here. So we'll be back in. Yeah, we'll be back in. You know what? Actually, you're from the VA. Uh, if, if they would like to, if they would just talk about it. Thanks, Joe. You want to chat? Okay. I'm not really sure. I can't get more about you than what you've already done. All right. Um, next is a um, uh, discussion this evening on the uh, motor pool update. Um, Dad and Jeff are going to present some information to council regarding that. So tonight, um, Jeff and I wanted to go over in a little bit more detail some of the motor pool um, plans that we talked about. Um, First, we're going to also introduce the ambulance purchase uh, back in August. Um, just a little bit of background. The motor pool was originally created by the sale of the Dune subdivision back in the early 90s. Um, that was a proceeds of $550,000. That original $550,000 provided resources um, to address the quality of the fleet, which my understanding was in pretty poor shape at that point in time. And that was actually drawn down a couple hundred thousand dollars pretty quickly to try to just addressing the curb maintenance. Today, um, the, the motor pool functions as an internal service fund. Um, it receives rent payments from the uh, different departments and then purchases of, purchase of equipment. The motor pool absorbs year-to-year -year fluctuations um, depending on the equipment needs in order to buffer the general fund of water and sewer or utility budgets and make them more stable. And it's also a source of funds for an emergency. Um, there's a motor pool committee which jointly manages and, and looks at the motor pool. Um, it's the public works director, the public safety director, and myself. Um, 
Jeff and Dave take the primary lead in evaluating the motor pool needs. He's looking at the fleet, looking at what equipment they have, um, the condition of the fleet, that sort of thing. Um, the long-term projections are then done jointly, um, where we introduce the financial numbers as to what the costs are and stuff, and then also the expected service size. And then the annual budget is also a joint, um, joint effort. Eventually, that's all distilled down and presented in the manager's proposed budget, which goes in front of the council. Um, we had a recent review of the motor pool plan, as we mentioned. Um, the previous plan needed an update and a refresh. Um, Jeff and I updated and verified the entire fleet inventory just to make sure we had everything on the plan. Um, there was a reevaluation of the motor pool needs and priorities by, by the Public Works Department primarily, but also the, the Public Safety Department. Um, the Public Works got some valuable input from both the equipment operators and from the mechanics uh, as part of that review of the motor pool. Um, when you add that to the ambulance purchase opportunity, which council acted on a couple months ago, it, it resulted in needing to revise that motor pool to make sure all the numbers would work. We presented that in a summary during the ambulance discussion. Um, the revised plan, it looks out 10 plus years of the entire fleet that the city has and utilizes, utilizes expected service life on those uh, equipment and vehicles and also estimated replacement <coughs> and inflationary factors are, are in current pricing. Um, we established a replacement schedule based on that, um, which obviously is just a plan and, and a subject to evolving facts and circumstances and needs. But at least it's a template for moving forward. Um, the plan preserves adequate ending fund balance, although it does absorb flu fluctuations um, depending on equipment and we've talked about. And that plan will be really due to end as part of the budget. We had a plan prior to that. Um, this has just been updated. This isn't intended for you to read the numbers, but it just gives you an idea of the different pieces of equipment, and you can kind of see the cash flow scheduled out there. Um, so that, that's what the plan looks like. It does both expenditures and revenues. You can see there's a fair number of pieces of equipment that the city has. That's our plow trucks and our pickup trucks and our utility vehicles and the police cruisers and some of the public safety vehicles. Is that particular plan traditionally incorporated into our budgets? It is. The, 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 the current year is, is, uh, is what we're about. Just want to talk about some of the changes. Although I can't see them, there's all the rider lawnmowers on in the. Yeah. When I was first informed that I was a, a part of this committee, Ed provided the spreadsheet and asked me for my thoughts and suggestions. And uh, quite frankly, it's a little overwhelming. When you look at the left-hand side of that page, each line item is a separate piece of equipment that is owned by the city. So in, in order for me to understand what the fleet existed, uh, or exi the existing fleet is, um, I went through with all the operators, with the mechanics, and went and looked at every single piece of equipment. We looked at condition, we uh, charted out what we thought the life expectancy was on everything that's, that's, that's in the water and sewer department and in the uh, public works. Based on that and all the employee input, um, we put together a revised plan, and this is kind of a summary of that. We have a 2004 water service van. I'm sure everybody has seen that around. It gets used every single day. Um, that van is stocked with, with pounds and pounds and pounds of water meters, tools, copper fittings, pipe, and it is wreaks havoc on the brakes of that, that van, and the van wasn't designed to handle that much weight and be traveling around. So, um, and we're also experiencing severe problems with the transmission now. So, um, our proposed, proposed plan is to replace that with a different pickup truck that's built and has a chassis that will accomplish all that weight and then put a utility service body that's appropriate. Um, the oldest pickup truck that we have in the fleet is a 2001 parts uh, truck and we would look at replacing that as the oldest truck in the fleet with a new pickup. And then uh, we spent time with all the departments in trying to rearrange the best truck for the right usage, the seasonal implications of it, following and all sorts of different things. So we're gonna be doing some internal moving around. 
that doesn't affect any, any budgets. Um, we looked at, we actually had money purchased for new mowers this year, and when we sat down with the Parks Department, uh, the Parks Department simply asked for a couple of our mowers to be repaired, and a new mower deck on one, and some refurbishment of a couple others um, that we can cover out of our repair and maintenance budget items, but they did not desire or feel that they needed to purchase any mowers this year. What they did ask for, um, and this was asked for um, pretty consistently throughout Public Works, is the ability to purchase uh, snow buckets. And these are the, the when you go out to the, the large parking lots like Kmart and uh, Dunham's and stuff, a lot of the big parking lots have these snow buckets that attach to the loaders, and they're simply made for pushing snow, and they can push a much greater volume of snow than what just a, a loader bucket can. So we think that it's got great use in our uh, in all the parking lots that we have. We think that it will help uh, with snow cleaning in the downtown area. Um, one of the first places that we take snow from the downtown is down at the beach, so that parking lot down at Fifth Avenue Beach, this would be used down there. Um, and we're actually talking about two different snow buckets, one that could be used with both of our very large loaders, but then also a much smaller one that would, would attach to our small uh, skid steer. And one of the, the, the most difficult thing, and quite frankly, the, the biggest body damage that occurs to our trucks is when we're plowing downtown. And we, excuse me, and we go in, in and out of all the, the curbs, the light poles, the fire hydrants, the sign posts, and uh, they actually make snow buckets for those small skid steers where we can turn 90 degrees and turn 180 degrees and simply push that snow out on the street. So we've actually, the staff has been, been working on this for about three, four months to look at ways that we can do what we need to do in a better fashion. And so this is part of that, part of the result of that. Um, and as you're aware, the Brown Ambulance that has already been approved. Uh, the street sweeper uh, purchase was actually booked in under last year's budget, uh, not under this year's. And in last year's budget, we had a plow truck uh, budgeted. There was $100,000 that was budgeted for a new plow truck. When I took over the responsibilities in May, I quite frankly did not know enough about the purchasing of a plow truck or the need or the necessity and did not have enough time to get that uh, put together and, and get before council before the end of that year. So we deferred that truck purchase into this year. The oldest truck in our fleet is a 1992 uh, Ford, and it is it spends more time in the shop than it does out on the road. One of the things that's important to remember is that the older, as these, as this uh, fleet ages and the maintenance costs go up, that has to be absorbed by our annual budgets, and those budgets are always being restricted and, and trying to be controlled. So as those maintenance items go up. Um, it really affects our ability to do the day-to-day -day jobs. The, the DPW, for many years, took the oldest dump trucks or the oldest plow trucks in the fleet and simply put a V-box in the back of them so that they are outfitted for sand and salt applications. And we have three of those trucks right now. Um, but those are our first line of defense. And so we feel that, in, in fact, for the past two years, it's been budgeted by Mr. Garber to start replacing those trucks, and the rest of the uh, staff and myself feel that that's the way to go. This is not a, a picture of the truck, but it's an example of the truck that would be re replacing it. Uh, it's a single axle, it's got a stainless steel box that's built for sand and salt applications so that we, those bodies will last longer. And one thing that this doesn't show, but the, the pro truck that, that we have priced out actually has a paraglide. It's got a separate blade that folds up on the side of the truck and extends out and helps to get additional lane widths. Um, we think it'll have great benefit on our major streets and getting more plowed in, in one place <coughs> and also along the highways and uh, down at the beaches. Could that, Jeff, would that prevent, prevent us from having to have two dual trucks uh, going side by side, that, that, that extra wing? Because right now we, we send a truck to kind of ship it over the side, and another truck puts it over into the right of way into the yards. Yeah. Eventually, I believe 
we this is where almost all the snow removal agencies, all the county cities are going, is going up to these paraglides. Um, interestingly enough, they were invented back 100 years ago, or when, you, when the first trucks were first put out on the road, but they're really coming out into play because you can plow more area with the same, with one driver. Um, if, if this works out like we believe it will, then the next the subsequent purchases may have them also and be able to clear the, the highway of, of half the highway lane in two passes rather than having three or four trucks. It also has the capability of when that blade comes down to not go all the way down to the ground so it can be raised up and we can bench back and push back snow, snow banks to some of the areas where we get a lot of dirt. This is a picture of the uh, 2004 Econoline van. Um, there were a lot of fingers crossed today when they tried to get it started. Uh, fortunately, it, it made it today, but it's really on its last leg. And this is the back of that truck where, where all that um, and materials are stored. This is an example of, of a truck that, that we are proposing to purchase. Um, we've actually bid out the, the cabin chassis and then comparable uh, utility service bodies on the back. Uh, but this would allow them to store and access all the materials uh, on, on a daily basis when they're making those service calls. And this is the oldest uh, Ford pickup in the fleet. Um, we, we took it for to get a price for a trade in today. Um, they asked us not to bring it back, but actually he ended up giving us a price for it. Um, but it's in pretty rough shape, and, and then again, that's given by the Parks Department on a daily basis. Um, and then this was the low bid of the price of the trucks that we did bid out, um, and we bid them out to all three of the local truck dealers. Did you want to do the summary? So when Jeff and Dave came to me with all their changes, we, we put them on the plan and kind of looked at what the impact was over, over a two-year period, last fiscal year budget and this fiscal year budget. And the revised motor pool budget reduces the two-year cash outlay by $70,000. And that's for a variety of reasons. Obviously, there are different needs and priorities identified, um, a different mix of equipment, different mix of financing versus cash purchases and the timing of purchases. Um, those savings of the cash would accrue to the cash reserves to be used in future years for the plan. But the easy way to think about all these changes is basically we're buying a little bit more ancillary equipment and we, we had a hundred thousand budgeted for a plow truck which we didn't buy and that's going to be addressed in the plan in later years. So that's kind of the crux of, of why we have that, that surplus, that cash. This just breaks it down. Um, we had a variance in the 2012-2013 the, uh, budget, a negative variance there of about 54000 But with the changes, we're going to have a positive variance in the, in the budget we're in right now of about 125000 So that net two-year variance is the 70000 that I spoke about, and that's kind of cash basis. And again, it takes into consideration all those different things, different equipment, different financing versus cash, timing, different things. What I'm excited about from the standpoint is, is that I think we're, here, we're, we're engaging a better process uh, as to how we're establishing the motor pool fund. Um, by engaging the employees at a greater level, by engaging the candidates at a greater level, and looking at it from that perspective and bringing in their expertise. The guys who know the plow trucks, they know the plow trucks better than any of us who are ever going to know those plow trucks. Um, and I think so. I think the process will be stronger moving forward by having a deeper engagement uh, of uh, all the employees of the DPW as to what really are we looking at, how do we go uh, about constructing our motor pool budgets for the future. That outlay for this year's budget, the one was it 125? Are these all cash purchases? There are no. No, no, um, no the, the, the truck that will be coming in front of council is going to be financed. The plow truck. The plow truck, right. The, the, the pickup truck that council agrees on the consensus plan will be paid for on the cash. <laughs> so then what's the commitment in the outgoing years? Uh, for the plow truck, it's going to be approximately 30000 plus interest, so maybe 32000 Going forward, all of those cash flows. If we go back to here, 
this analysis is really sensitive to whether you pay for something in cash or you finance it. And with the, with the low interest rate environment right now, the interest isn't amounting to a whole lot. Obviously, that's going to change in our years. But when you put this together, I'm, I'm focusing on, obviously, what the costs are, what the revenue is coming in for rent out of the area. My main focus is on what the end of the fund is to make sure that plan works. And so we have a mixture of cash and financing purchases. You can see the top part of that, those are all cloud trucks, and those are generally too big to purchase out of cash in this plan, so we kind of finance those. Whereas we might buy a pickup truck in cash or a service van or cash and that sort of thing. So getting back to this, the yeah, some of the costs for this plow truck have been pushed into our years because of finances, but on the flip side, we bought this sweeper with cash, which was intended to be financed. So those two kind of wash out with each other. Um, but the bottom line is that in the context of this plan, from a cash outlay in that particular year, that's where we come up with the that's, that's last year and this year. Um, yeah, what is what are we committing to in the upcoming years? Well, the cost of the cost of the plow truck is going to be one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, which is what we built in the budget, but we're just going to be financing it. And I've got the financing bids in that would be part of the agenda. Um, I mean, you, we can I can go through this. I can't do it off of this screen here, but. But the cost of each year, those vary from year to year based on the equipment. And we have the revenues growing at a, at a standard rate. So that that bottom line fund balance, this plan actually has it going down. And I think it, it gets a low of about $180,000 because we've got a lot of the first stuff on the snowball and that starts to ramp back up. So the, the only purchases we're going to make this year is from uh, the DPW, police department doesn't need any new vehicles and the fire department. Course, the, you know, the well, we're purchasing the wrong yeah. ambulance. Yeah, the ambulance. So, so yeah, there's no other, there's no other public safety. Okay. I think we think yeah. reached the last year because of the purchase. I think. Here, you're right. 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 Yeah. And, then, and then the manager's car was purchased. Yeah. 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 Are the cuts going to be a four wheel drive? <coughs> yes. Yes. Are they going to be, I see it on the picture you had a ram that was a 1500. That's a hit. Um, that's not necessarily a heavy duty truck. Are you going to move it? We put it down truck where you stick with the assets. We actually have uh, a couple more three quarter ton trucks that we really need. And so those some of those are our oldest ones right now. And so we're gonna push those into the parks department where they're used by summer employees. Um, and they also have the ability to have plows mounted to them. We've got a couple heavy plows, so they'll be used as a spare when we need them during the winter time. One of the things that I'd like to point out is that when we, that chart that's up there, if you look at it in detail, it, it has a year's purchase, it has a, an estimated service life, it has a scheduled uh, replacement time, and it has what we can afford to replace them at. And so if you look at, if you look at it in detail, um, we are not advancing this too aggressively. We have, we have looked at it, Dave and I and Ed have looked at this and booked out these purchases over a 10 year, per, 10 year period. And some of them we're gonna to have to live with old equipment. We're gonna to have to wait until we can afford it. We're gonna to have to wait till the schedule allows us the money to catch up to it. And so the money that is available, we are trying to prioritize from, from the response that we get from the mechanics and the operators on which are the highest priorities. In my understanding is that right now, um, we have what, about three hundred four hundred thousand dollars in there, and you're going to uh, knock it down to about one hundred eighty thousand. Is that you know? And then slowly build it back on up. What, what, what that just shows you is that between last year and this year, we will actually decrease that fund balance by seventy thousand dollars with what we're proposing in front of you. So the month, so we are one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars ahead this year. And we combine that with the fifty thousand dollars we're behind from last year, it, it creates that seventy thousand yeah, dollar. I guess it would help to have that list, you know, the equipment, what that cost was for the budget, and now what we're looking at, what that list is, and what that revised cost. It's more of a visual that would help us understand. Sure. And the answer to Councilmember Cody's question is the um, the hundred and seventy, hundred eighty thousand dollar trough and the fund balance of out a number of years. 
based on equipment purchases going going forward. So you're going to slowly bring it down and yeah, bring it back on up through the usefulness of the equipment that you're purchasing. Correct. And, and, and install and install and try to build it back on up. Based on all the assumptions and what we've talked about is. How much money do you normally put uh, pay back into the water pool per year? If you're going to go down on the right up, and you're right going to try to build it, build it back on up with your anticipation of Right. I, I, believe, I believe it's around, and I don't, I don't have that number, but it's around 300,000 in that neighborhood. I could pull it That's how much you're putting and, back in yeah, yeah. Yeah. per year. Yeah. Okay. It's roughly. Yeah, I understand. Right. Right. And we had to increase that allocation by 35,000 just so we could fund the ambulance. Mm -hmm. This is paying for our enhanced transport revenue. Okay. So and, and, and the goal is to get back on the requirement. It, it, no, I don't think that is the goal. I don't think we're ever going to get back to the 550000 because the fleet was in such disrepair back in the early 90s that they just drew it down to get the equipment up to a decent level. It's been, no, it's been hovering at the 350 level for quite a while. Well, we did that was one thing they were going to have. Well, it hasn't been there in my tenure yet. Before, it's always been at that level. Before we the had the motor pool, the motor pool, the the equipment was in really, really bad shape. I mean, it was, it was the public. Oh, you did drive it. Yes, we did. The car was completely covered. It always got the best of But I can remember when we got the best When the motor pool came into existence, that's when we started building, you know, the, the equipment. Back. The first thing we bought was cop cars. Yeah. And, and the motor pool is really, it kind of functions as a revolving fund. <laughs> If you didn't have the luxury of having the sale of the doing subdivision, it would be basically a pay as you go. What this does is it just allows for more consistency and more predictability in the general and water and sewer fund buckets, <laughs> knowing that this is going to absorb some of the fluctuations, but if you plan it out, then we can keep it so it doesn't get in a bad situation. I want to make sure you go back to your request for inflation. So what's the current what you're really looking for is a readable version of what's up in front of you today. So I had some that. That's what I would like to get that. Let's let's not do that electronically because we're restrained on the card. How about we? I can plot those full size and we can pull them up and put them in a package. Yeah, okay, great. And then I can. Well, we'll get them to you. I'm just looking at that. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's not a problem. Let's see it. There's, there's actually another whole section of that up down below. This is it. In previous years, and, and you know, I commend you for going out and working with the mechanics and the crew and getting their input. Has that happened in the past, or is this kind of a, a new pilot type of uh, initiative? <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm not comfortable speaking to the past, but I but I'm uh, trying to manage this the way I believe is best. I mean, again, people are, are most supportive of an environment they help create. That's why I was, I was wanting to give you some kudos in that respect, because when they get involved with the, the capital purchases, that, then they start taking care of the capital purchases. They see the longevity, they see the life, they see the, the, the value of, yeah. of, of, of getting in there and taking care of those vehicles. When something's broken, they get it fixed versus letting it go for a period of time. And, and again, I think over time, that mentality and that growth will engage your people even, even more. Yeah, I, I, would, I mean, internally, this has been a great process for us. It's opened up some communication. Um, I've seen people offering and sharing as opposed to trying to keep and protect their own turf. I think it's been a very good experience. I mean, I think that's the only way to manage a fleet of that size. Thank you. To get people involved that are utilizing the equipment. The other, thing, the other thing that's important is there's a lot of stuff that we have that we don't use. And so, um, it might be a segue to the next topic, but we're, we're working on how to get rid of that stuff and how, what's the best way to dispose of it. Well, you could see that in the fire department when they purchased the ambulance. You know, everybody got involved in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, have, I, think that was, I think I I, I believe it's accurate to say that that was more of a culture yeah. in the fire department where the captains and the, the firemen were very involved in the specifications. <laughs> Excuse me, of all of the pieces of equipment. When we bought the ladder trucks, uh, got everybody involved, involved, everybody involved in uh, looking at stuff. We realized we had a tremendous amount of expertise in the department of public works. When you knew that, yeah. we needed to have yeah. them in that expertise. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of talent. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there's just some reprioritization of the water pool based upon different experiences and different conversations. And we wanted to make sure that we presented that to you this evening so you were aware of that. Good, yeah. Okay. I, got, I got one question here on one comment. Um, when Jeff was uh, describing uh, the uses for that snowball, he made a comment that he would be plowing the beach. You got to hold to that? Because a couple of years it did get plowed. And I think everybody wants to go down there. I strongly you mean encourage the beach. The beach. What I'm using the parking. What I was the park not really referring plow. to is the plow. I'm going on the road around. Why would you plow them? Uh, because you got your brick, if you're going to get the um, brick scoops for your um, voters, they're going to take care of that, that parking lot. For the last for the last eight years, we've been plowing past the dog park. Previous to previous to that time frame. We stopped off in front of the dog park, and we had a lot of citizens saying, hey, we can't get to the, the dog park. Perfect sense. And so we, we moved that. So your comment is, why not just keep right on the go? I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to Jeff to contemplate. No, I, I think that's a fair discussion. I do too. I, because I say, what, people like to go down there, and I get a bunch of complaints about, in fact, I'm one of them. I'm going to myself why, why we can't go around because that day was you stockpile it, you keep pulling up. It okay. takes more energy for that water to stockpile it. I go up and keep going right on. Have we ever plowed it all the way around? We used to in a long time, but I mean, I think <coughs> years you, you stopped that one year, totally you never done it. I mean, go right down there, but why can't you continue to go right on through? I think it's all these great Good question. Great. Um, we're going to move into, thank you very much for your discussion on that. Uh, you all this, I'm not sure. Can you give me back to the wrap-ups? Um, surplus, pur surplus purchase, no, excuse me, surplus property policy. Um, we've been talking about this for quite a while with council, um, and we've been working on this. We have solicited multiple other uh, um, communities. Uh, online and list sort of questions about how do you get rid of property, how do you get rid of property. Um, I, it's, it's kind of all over the board, but it's kind of like pretty narrow in that perspective too on how to get rid of it. We all know why we're talking about this tonight. Um, and you received a copy of the uh, of the surplus property policy, general policy number 71. Um, trash, we're trying to identify certain things, we're trying to identify what can be thrown away, what may not be thrown away, um, who's responsible for identifying that, uh, really focusing on the department directors um, in that aspect. Um, for doing so, uh, disposition, how do we get rid of it? Once we identify that we're not going to use it anymore, how do we get rid of it? Uh, we have come to a kind of a, a common belief that it is if it's scrap, if it's metal, if it's if it's uh, cast iron, um, old catch basins which have broke out, uh, aluminum signs, that all has value. And that has value. Just intrinsic value is scrap uh, as a collective. So um, that's not going to be identified as trash. Scrap itself, we're just going to intrinsically metal, if you will, is going to intrinsically be seen as a valuable commodity and one that we're going to hold until we dispose of that as revenue in the city. But there are other things. For example, a year or two ago, I think it was last year, when we were changing out um, computers, um, we, we cleaned them against, we had probably eight or 10, maybe 12 old computers, relatively decent shape. We cleaned them all up, uh, tried to sell them. There really wasn't a value to selling them. And then we tried getting them to uh, various nonprofit agencies. I think it was a human service collaboration for trying to get those in the hands of those individuals. We probably spent more time and energy than we received in revenue coming back in for disposing of those. We can look at that a little bit differently. So, what this policy really was, and to set forward with us, how are we going to get rid of those materials? We've tried to show also in number three here kind of a hierarchy, if you will, of how we believe in disposing of the property. Internal transfer of equipment, 
uh, items within the city departments, the curbing and tamp list, the city assessor uh, got a new, um, a new printer this last year. It's a budgeting process. Her old printer went to the building department. They're going to utilize that. They didn't need the same high speed or the color functions that she did in pictures, so it's going to work just fine for that. So internally, how, how do we get that through? We do have internal swapping internally among departments. Uh, it's the highest use that we can see. Um, the next one we came to is trade-in for other equipment. Uh, so now you've heard about the trade-in value for the account line van, the trade-in value for um, the pickups, um, the trade-in value. Routinely, you'll see trade-in value for some of the large piece of equipment, such as the vacuums or the street sweeper that we have internal processes with the companies that turn that in. Uh, anything we can use to buy down costs, we look at that trade-in value is, uh, is good for us. Transfer to another government or nonprofit organization. That could be the Human Service Collaboration Board. Um, <coughs> often, often communities are looking for our own snow fence. Fair Lane uh, or Nakama, they would like to be able to snow fence because it's getting really in bad shape. They're looking for those different products going to them. So, can we get into another government would be to provide a similar level of service? I think that's going to happen a few and far between, quite frankly. Um, but can we do it? Does that make it feasible or possible? Uh, negotiate sale. Is there is there a willing to sale products or projects? Um, not 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 so much just hey how much uh, myself wanting to buy something or Brad for wanting to buy something, but more of an organized sale. We need to have like we used to have a garage sale. Many of you will remember the garage sales that we used to have at the Department of Public Works. I was only familiar with one of those that we did uh, in the past twelve years. The surplus sales have been around for a long time. Yeah, and I just I just. None of the communities that I've worked in have, have really done that. Um, so it'll be the old computers, office equipment, yeah. yes. Right. 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 Do they do it? Yeah, I've seen them doing one this Saturday. Um, so that sale of scraps, solicitation of written bids, uh, and you can see it uh, getting on down the list. Mm -hmm. The intent here really is to set forth rules and regulation on how we're going to dispose of materials and not leaving enough to individual department directors or city managers or anyone else to set forth those rules. It's to set forth a series of rules on how we're going to do this to ensure that we're not having inappropriate, just, uh, inappropriate uh, loss of revenue or um, disposal of property. Right. We put some other in situations in here, um, uh, penalties and uh, these are the four or five and six law came from the city attorney as to his lands that he wanted to have incorporated into that. Um, substantial value. The disposition of any one item of personal property with an estimated value of ten thousand or more must be first approved by city council. That's a large dollar amount. Mm -hmm. You know, ten grand or something is pretty pretty substantial. Even that would have to be factors <coughs> and some of a large piece of equipment. Uh, traditionally when our cruisers are done. You know, we're looking at fifteen hundred bucks mm -hmm. for trade in for the cruisers. Uh, you saw the pickups tonight and stuff like that. So, uh, ten grand would be a very, very small amount of what we dispose of. Uh, probably the lower three to four percent of what we dispose of. But still, we're applying that. So we're putting that out there. How we're going to do it? Um, I think this is a really important part of it down here too. Um, some things just aren't always going to make sense. There's going to be something that that doesn't comply with anything up here for, you know, it's truly trash, we need to have a tracking mechanism. There needs to be a tracking mechanism. Where did it go? How did it dispose of? Who was responsible for that? Who made that decision? Signatures uh, in doing so. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I put these down here as I think these are really important. Uh, are you a city official or are you a former city official? Because I think we need to be held, we need to look at this as a higher standard <coughs> than other individuals. And quite frankly, I think there's been a past practice of uh, city officials and retirees having a different standard than what we would have for our citizens at large. And we need to um, we need to change that and bring it all under one uh, and treat everyone the same. So that was the surplus policy that we have uh, come up with. I'm just going to mention the very last uh, comment there. Yeah, well, okay. um, you're asking 
question, yes, no, what, what does that mean? So yes, you are a formal city official. You don't get it? I think that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that probably should be clarified. Yeah, that's a good point. Because yeah. what does it mean? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing about it, I love that we have this global asset, you know, process and policy that we're building that. Um, and I, I just worry sometimes because of the complexity of the departments, the, the, the massive amount. I mean, I went through, you know, the, the, the when I started uh, on this thing, you took me to Pertour at, you know, the, there's so much equipment there. So much equipment. And, and what I hate to see is process paralysis either. Mm -hmm. So um, that you get so caught up in a process of just, you know, getting rid of something becomes more cumbersome than, yeah. than the efforts to get rid of it. So, um, you know, obviously you have a, a, a a process that has some flexibility in it. Yeah, so I think this would like to bring the, the flexibility into that. Mm -hmm. There's got to be balance, but there also has to be accountability. I have one or two or three. Absolutely got to be accountability for the process. But, you know, if Jeff's sitting on, you know, 2,000 widgets because we ordered them because they were on sale and they, we don't use them anymore, right. how do they get rid of that, you know? Right. It becomes uh, one of those things that he has to keep scale it. But it's one of this, or if you say there's 30 of this, and, you know, the things that we have to keep and an example would be is that I think we have 35 gallons of mini paint down there at one point in time that mm -hmm. went over the I mean, just, just must have a great deal. But there was just gallons of mint green paint. And mm -hmm. everything went through. So I'm saying you'll remember that green paint. Probably bought it over at the Army Circle. I think you did. Yeah. I think you did. It's my yellow box. It's everywhere. 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 Um, it needs to be a balance, yeah. but, the, but the key here is that we got to bring accountability Absolutely. into how we dispose of it. And it needs to be above the board, accountable to all, uh, and uh, that's what we're trying to achieve this evening. So, one point that I appreciate that you put in is the, if it's at the end of its useful life, and then the cost of sale or disposal would exceed um, any sales value, then it's trash, basically. You know, I, I, I'll be honest with you, and, and we're going to see this again next spring because we're going to have spring trash haul again next spring. Mm -hmm. and trash is incredibly subjective. <laughs> and it's incredibly subjective. And we you have know, the number of folks that drive around <coughs> looking for window panes to do their artistic. I, I, it's just, I always find that really interesting when you see that couple of weeks of those number of individuals that, that are, that, and they're not looking for a lot of folks, I mean, they're looking for the metals and the scrap and that value, but some folks are looking for things other than that, mm -hmm. that they have a specific interest in, that, that Mayor Kenny and I may think, at the door. Mm -hmm. But it's just really interesting, but we needed to have that definition up there, yeah. and we needed to have that up there, and, um, and the department director is going to have to evaluate those on an individual case by case basis. But and this at least now gives them a process and a policy to, to follow. How do you think to do like a three month review on this to see how it's functioning so that you can tweak it? And, uh, I hadn't thought about that long ahead, but we'd be sure we can. If it's not going to be working. We've discussed this. I, I would submit that every week at our staff <coughs> meetings, things like this get discussed or brought up. Yeah. When there's input, I would say this has been discussed in our staff meeting like five times. Probably. Uh, due to the sensitivity of this particular issue, we discussed this one probably four to five times and revised it multiple times. Surprisingly, we didn't have something that was in place. I went to the general policy, like, what's got to be in there? That's in there. So, yeah. So, again, Council Member, right, present sir. this to you this evening. Uh, <coughs> or suggestions, uh, like Council Gibbs said, please email those to me. Uh, if your experiences with the, the tribal uh, disposition policy makes sense, or CMS, or, or uh, PCA, or any of the other ones have policy things that work really well, please let me know and we'll try and incorporate those in. Thank you very much for your time this evening.